Welcome everyone. Today I'm going to introduce briefly a dialogue that Heidegger published between him and a gentleman from Japan who was unnamed in this dialogue because I think that the dialogue itself is um, a summary written by Heidegger of many of the conversations and dialogues he will have had with members of the Kyoto school. The dialogue is published in Unterwegs zur Sprache or On the Way to Language and it is entitled Aus einem Gespräch von der Sprache. That means an excerpt of a dialogue on language between a Japanese and someone who's asking questions. Heidegger is the one who's asking questions. The dialogue begins, and this is crucial, with the mentioning of Count Schutzo Kuki, who is a student of Heidegger. And Kuki, at the moment when this dialogue was written, was already dead. The Japanese gentleman mentions he died too early, and that his teacher was Nishida. So we have here the recollection and the memory of another mortal with which this dialogue on language sets in. And this dialogue is not just something about linguistic theory, etc., but no, it dances around the danger of language and translation precisely in the moment where we begin to meet Eurocentrism bursts open, begin to meet other modes and ways of being and other languages, other houses of being, as it was. Heidegger will say later in the dialogue, it seems that the Japanese and the European live in different houses of being, if language is indeed the house of being. They mention also here in the beginning that Kuki was interested in the Japanese notion of iki, which will leave untranslated. What was it that occurred in the dialogues that Heidegger had with Count Kuki? When he returned Kuki, that is, from Europe to Japan and held lectures in Kyoto about aesthetics and aesthetics of Japanese art and poetry, this is what Heidegger then asks, is that even possible? Can we at all have aesthetical concepts taken from European aesthetic theory applied to Japanese arts and poetry? The Japanese scholar here asks, why not? Well, because these terms arise from European thinking. And that is to say there would be a distortion of Japanese thought if we blindly applied European concepts to the Japanese way of thinking. However, the Japanese gentleman here answers that there is a certain incapacity he thinks that the encounter between Japan and Europe revealed to the Japanese thinkers, which is what? Which is that what Japanese thinking, or well, the language itself, lacks, he says, are unambiguous or univocal, eindeutig concepts. And the Japanese language then lacks the limitating force or strength to determine objects and hierarchize them unambiguously. This is what he points out. And the important notion here and um, when uh, is, is really here the unambiguous, the eindeutig with a single meaning or so that the concept, the begriff is is in the European understanding of language 
where the European languages make this possible, where this is seemingly not possible in Japan or in the Japanese language, and therefore they imported this way of thinking. But this to Heidegger is a distortion, and the Japanese scholar, of course, then also agrees because there is something here, um, namely that the Europeanization, which means the technization of the world, this colon, this technological colonization of the world, is marching ahead. And in the foreground of it, it seems that at once there's not just an incapacity uh, revealed of the Japanese language, but that what must also reveal itself um, is that um, the technological world is tearing them away. So they are trying to keep up. That's what I'm trying to say. They're trying to keep up with the Europeanization of the world, the technological, with the technicization of the world through applying European concepts to their own ways of being or to try and preserve something of its own kind. But Heidegger says that what's limiting is in itself this kind of technical metaphysical language distorts the Japanese way of thinking and will not allow them to preserve something. At the same time, Europe is forgetting itself. It forgets its origin. It forgets where it, all this technical metaphysical language comes from. Metaphysics, as it fulfills and completes itself, is not something of the past, but now becomes almost, you could say, applicable and, in that sense, um, dangerous. Um, so this, these are Heidegger is never after a simple critique of metaphysics or something benign as a deconstruction of metaphysics and all the other silly attempts uh, that, you know, hurl around. But no, no, the, the, metaphysics is now standing in front of us and it's becoming something that we have to deal with almost in, in an instantiation of itself in the technological world. The language of technology is imbued with technical terms from metaphysics. Just think of dynamic um, uh, potential, uh, the impossible. Uh, uh, it's, it, so, um, or in, in German, the word Vorstellung, right? Um, or system, system. So we have here a, a moment where the where the chap where the Europeans, the European language, the European Europe forgets itself at the same time. There's a colonization of the world with its um, attempt at ordering unambiguously through concepts and hierarchization the world, which destroys world access for other modes of being as that of the Japanese and destroys their houses, as it were. And this kind of this, this unambiguousness, that's the most important one, because the what the Japanese language still seems to allow for is ambiguity, is an ambiguity which is, which is always also pointing to an inexhaustibleness, an exuberance of meaning and of sense that cannot be controlled and managed for. So Heidegger is decidedly and explicitly not saying is that a dialogue is not possible. So I'll say this again. Heidegger does not say that a dialogue is impossible. Completely the opposite. A dialogue is possible and absolutely necessary, but it will only be possible if the European is open to a completely other way of thinking and to a completely different language that is not easily communicable and translatable into the European technical vernacular of aesthetics, for example, as in this case. So there is dialogue. There must be dialogue. And this is the century now more than the last to have this dialogue. But without trying to pull everyone into the same house of being, but to where we have to cultivate an oikonomia of a neighborhood of the houses of being in different languages. Because Heidegger says, and this I'll just leave as a hint here, at some point, early on in the dialogue, 
Heidegger does say that there is a certain realm that language discloses, opens up, throws open, we could almost say, so that a thinking experience can become possible, which gifts the awareness that European, Occidental and Far Eastern saying, and that means letting show and letting be, saying the world means let the world appear in it by itself, to bring these in dialogue in such a way that such things, which flows from one single source. There is one single source, a wellspring, that is beginning to reveal itself as worlds unite and collide. But this single source will be poisoned if we flatten and level everything into the same system that's already controlled, where every concept is already clear. But the spring, this wellspring, this source, will remain rich and fresh and vigorous and lively if we allow for its unfolding in a genuine manifoldness out of a onefold. There is an all unifying one at work for anyone who can still see and think. But to cherish this source as the source of the manifold, that seems to be the task of this new ecumenical planet that we are entering. So thank you very much indeed. And if you'd like to learn more about either the Kyoto School or Heidegger, then please follow the link down below in the description. Thank you very much.